Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Us Anything. This is our segment of Immaculate Dissection co-founders and teaching team members, where we come on every Sunday for a free webinar, and we answer your anatomy-based questions. I'm one of your co-founders. I'm Dr. Kathy Dooley. Super excited to be here on the last day of May in this uh, pandemic that we're having, and we, we really are enjoying each other's company on Sundays, and I know that I really look forward to this. I'm so glad to introduce you to the other teaching team members that are here with us. Uh, amazing co-founder, uh, Dr. Anna Folkmer. Let me pin your video. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, happy almost June, everyone. <laughs> and uh, great to be here for another Ask Us Anything. I'm Dr. Anna Folkmer, one of your co-founders and co-hosts for this webinar. Awesome. And then uh, Danny Quirk, uh, amazing co-founder. Let me zoom you in. There you go. Hey, everybody. I'm Danny, the, uh, the artist for Immaculate Dissection, one of the co-founders as well with these two lovely people. And uh, happy to be here and uh, chat and dork with anatomy with you guys. <laughs> and we also have a teaching team member. I'm desperately trying to unmute her, but it's becoming difficult for me. Uh, there we go. Hold on. Let's try it one more time. Not working on my end. There we go. Karen Ravelis. Hello. Hey, how are you guys doing tonight? <laughs> Pretty great. Tell them who you are and where you're from. I'm Karen Ravelis. I'm on the ID teaching team. I'm very proud of it, and I'm from Connecticut. Uh, we're so glad to have you here tonight. Uh, and I'm sure that Karen would like to weigh in on what the co-founders are talking about tonight. We're super excited to have all you guys here uh, joining us. Uh, we've got some pretty good questions uh, to, to answer tonight. Uh, before we do, we wanted uh, to know that you guys inspired us. Uh, ask us anything. Actually spawned uh, a new thing called the ID Collaborative. It is not ID one through six courses, you know, all compiled into one course. That would be literally impossible for us to do with any kind of quality. So the ID online courses are completely separate. And Dr. Anna Folkmer is going to help us navigate on our website how you would get to the online courses. But the ID Collaborative is um, a weekly series of talks that we give. We pick a topic that's uh, from our members. Uh, a lot of our members are, have given us really great ideas on what to talk about, what they're interested in. And we decided to, to do talks. We've done talks on Bell's palsy. We've done talks on gender affirmation. We've done talks on breathing. Incredible stuff. And we're getting a lot of great feedback about it. Dr. Folkmer, I know that you designed this website. This, I think it's an amazingly easy to navigate website, but we do have a lot of stuff on it. So do you mind doing a screen share and showing them how they would navigate the ID website to get to the ID online courses or the ID collaborative? All right. So if you see here on our website, um, we've made it as user friendly as we possibly can. So um, from the home page, you actually can click on any of these. Everything on the home page is hyperlinked. So if there's something that you know you see on our home page listed that's got you super excited and you're like, hmm, oh, I'd really like to know about the anatomy of sciatica, then you can actually just click on there and uh, it will take you to the direct sign up for this particular episode. And this is an episode that is one of the many episodes in our collaborative series. So um, we have essentially, you know, we know a lot of people are spending a lot more time online with their online learning, and we wanted to make sure that everybody had plenty of content to keep them busy. Um, the ID team is, has no shortage of content. Uh, so what we've got for you is essentially you uh, can take ID one through six online. Um, that's not part of the collaborative. That is actually um, uh, something that you can get to if you go to sign up here at the top or from the homepage, like I said, if everything hyperlinks. So you can basically click on anything that looks interesting to you from the homepage and it'll take you straight there. Um, but if you wanna just sort of browse our current offerings, you can go to sign up, you can click on online courses, and you'll see ID one through six here um, that you can take. And so what this is, um, you'll notice that it is half price compared to what um, people normally would pay for uh, an international um, uh, ID course. And this is going to be uh, the Vimeo, it's, it's previous recordings 
of all things, you know, case studies, the coursework itself, um, the, the whiteboard notes, a lot of our supportive visual material and access to the online forum so that you can pose your questions there and, and, and you know, be involved with some of the group discussions that go on with some of the content. Um, but ID one through six are all offered online at $300 each. If maybe that's not something that you're sure about yet, you want to just participate in our uh, our webinars that we're doing on a weekly basis, and actually it's it's twice a week right now. Um, so if you're interested in that, we have the ID Collaborative. The ID Collaborative is going to be the annual membership. It runs from May of 2020 to May of 2021. So at any point when you jump in there, you'll gain access to everything that's been previously recorded that you can watch on your own times, and you can go ahead and jump in on the ones for the remainder of the year. And this does this is something that will um, uh, reset every year and you can opt in for every year. But you can see the different learning hours that we have done and that we are have scheduled for the next, uh, for the through the month of June. We haven't published a July schedule just yet, but we are working on it and we've got a, a lot of fun, amazing topics for you. Um, and so we have a lot of different things here. Um, we, we talked about gate. We had a great episode on Friday night. Uh, Tuesday night, we're going to be discussing about sciatica, um, which a lot of people, you know, have questions for. And, you know, if you're, if you're not sure if the collaborative membership investment is right for you, then you can just buy these a la carte $20 a piece. And if you decide, hey, I really like that one hour of learning and I'm interested in a couple of more, then you know you can actually take the $20 that you spent on a collaborative um, episode and apply it to the yearly membership. Because at $20 a piece or $200 for the whole year, if you think that you might see more than 10 topics over the course of a year, which if we're doing two a week, you've got a lot of topics to choose from. I mean, this is gonna work out to like less than $4 an episode. I mean, really we've tried to make this as absolutely affordable and they're fun. They're really fun. They're very group, you know, it, it, it is a group discussion. There's a lot of um, involvement. We have special guests on, we had Jonathan, um, we had Kate Wolofsky on there and we really, really are having a good time with this. And we wanna hear from you guys. We wanna hear what topics of interest we can include so that we can make sure that we address them. Because sometimes, you know, um, in the ID1 one through six courses, topics come up depending on who's in the class, what their specialties are, what you know, client or patient populations they're seeing. And we don't always have time to take a deep dive into condition specific or topic specific things because we're trying to adhere to a <laughs> curriculum. So we wanted an outlet so that we could kind of take a, a deeper dive and a, a have a further discussion of certain things. Um, you know, we had a great talk on Bell's Palsy the other night. It was really, really fun. Um, and so we, we just basically talk about the anatomy of these things and, and how to assess and, you know, what points to remember and clinical pearls there are. So it's a similar approach to ID one through six. It's just a, a very sort of focused one hour on a discussion on a particular topic of interest. It's basically like all the things we couldn't do in immaculate dissection like immaculate dissection is laying groundwork for an assessment process through functional anatomy but it doesn't leave us a ton of time to to cover what people like really directed interest like sciatica or bell's palsy like yeah we talked about bell's palsy for maybe five minutes in the immaculate dissection part five course the peripheral nerve entrapments but then we got a whole hour to talk about bell's palsy and we couldn't give a whole hour to talk about one cranial nerve in uh, the entirety of talking about the, in, the, the whole nervous system. So uh, it, it's a way for people that are not ID or have taken ID to come together to study with the ID team. And uh, yes, it is completely separate from our coursework. Uh, so it's complementary to our coursework, which is great. So the people that have taken ID will find it to be very inclusive to what they're doing. But for the people that haven't taken ID, it it's, it's also includes you too. It's, it's a fully, full-on anatomy loving family <laughs> yeah they're a lot like study groups if you're already part of the id family and you've taken an id course with us you've seen acts you know that you then have access to study groups um, but one of the great things about the id collaborative membership is that you don't have to have already taken an id course to join in with us these are free and are, are open to everybody um, you know we, we like i said we try to make this as cost efficient as absolutely possible um, just to you know we get 
all the recordings, you get follow-ups afterwards. And so um, we, we hope that, you know, people who are sort of dipping their toes in the water um, and maybe not totally ready for 15 hours of instruction, but, you know, are interested in what one hour of, of discussion looks like, and then maybe one hour a week or one hour twice a week. We hope that, um, you know, those people feel encouraged to join us because we have a, a lot of fun and we really like it when people are involved with the conversations with us. So you don't have to have already taken ID one through six to be involved in the membership. It's another reason why we call it the collaborative. It's everybody collaborating together on, uh, on these anatomy topics. And uh, for, for people that haven't taken ID coursework, it certainly might encourage it. Just like these ask us anything's might. And, uh, but it, it's not ex exclusive to that. We don't want you to, to feel left out if you haven't taken ID. And for people that have taken ID, you certainly need more studying for, for different um, pinpoint topics. And so it, it does help to solve that issue. So thank you, Dr. Fultmer. That was super, super helpful. So now you guys see how to navigate the website. It's always nice to see something as user-friendly as Anna has made it, but maybe you've missed the fact that, you know, you know, people will kind of look past everything and then just hit contact us and then we're going to send you right back to that page anyway. So, uh, and we'll say, well, it's just right there. Don't worry. And so now Anna has shown you kind of how to do it. So hopefully that will help out. So hopefully you can join us on Tuesday for the anatomy of sciatica talk, either as an ID collaborative member or maybe just one time, just spend your 20 bucks right on that one. And, and it, it's, it's cost efficient either way. And we, and we will definitely make it worth your while. You get a really nice handout afterwards. You get a full hour. Usually it goes past an hour because we are long with the tooth, so uh, we, we do really enjoy your company and, and we do like to answer your questions. Um, one of the questions from, uh, that was asked of us this week was to talk about coccidinia, coccygeal pain. And so we at ID talk uh, quite a bit about uh, coccygeal pain in our ID 1, 2, and 6 courses. And uh, coccidinia is, is really interesting. It, uh, most people will point to the things that attach to the coccyx, but we also want to know that non-traumatic coccygeal pain is, can be linked to uh, intervertebral disc degeneration and, and lumbar plexopathy. So uh, important things to remember. So uh, what I wanted to do is show you a, a share screen of some of the things we talk about in Immaculate Dissection 1. Here's Immaculate Dissection 1's manual, and here's the pelvic floor, uh, otherwise known as the pelvic diaphragm. You can see Danny's art here. Uh, Dr. Folkmer and I teach this segment, and we like to share our history of pelvic floor dysfunction with everyone. And we talk about this pelvic floor dysfunction very last, as far as uh, the intrinsic core stability system, and it's our fourth out of four total core assessments for ID1, meaning it's not the most important thing, but it is an important thing, particularly for people with coccidinia. So uh, a lot of uh, biomechanical forces, whether they're traumatic or non-traumatic, can very much affect the things that attach to the coccyx. Uh, these things can be things like the pelvic floor. So you're seeing coccygeus here, and uh, you're seeing iliococcygeus, uh, you're seeing pubococcygeus and puborectalis. So these muscles are all coming over and have an attachment to either the anococcygeal ligament, a ligament that goes from coccyx over to this median kind of raw fae. Um, and um, these tissues then anchor themselves via the ligament over to the coccyx. Now, the coccygeus itself does directly attach to the coccyx. So uh, these structures, along with some ligament structures we'll show in a second, are, are highly responsible for the stabilization of the coccyx. Um, making things more complicated here is the fact that the sympathetic chain on each side will come down. This is your fight or flight response, right? It helps to slow digestion down and also helps for you to amp up adrenal chemicals when you need to flee a situation, right? And they culminate, the sympathetic chain culminates right anterior to the coccyx on something called the ganglion impar. And this um, is, is been shown in very recent research to be a major, major player in the pain afferents related to coccidinia. So people are even doing injections into the ganglion impar. You'll go to like some orthopedists or pelvic floor specialists, OBGs, or urogynecologists, uh, they'll do injections onto the ganglion impar. And as the patient gets repetitive injections here, sometimes up to four, maybe even more if they're in a lot of discomfort, they'll notice between visits a longer amount of pain relief accumulating the more they get the injections done. And so um, it's a form of radio frequency. It, it's very similar to ablation, only it's called thermocoagulation. And, and basically they're, what they're trying to do is kind of slow the response to the ganglion impar, which is, is pretty clever. 
Uh, and uh, the caveat to that is that it doesn't always work for everyone, which is a bummer. Um, but an idea, a non-invasive version of it uh, would be to create stability of the things that are kind of cueing the coccyx, especially in non-traumatic cases, and then to reduce the, the neurogenic inflammation that happens with coccydinia. Uh, so what are the things attached to the coccyx besides the pelvic floor? Of course, we would ass assess the pelvic floor, but uh, there's uh, some pretty important structures that also attach to the coccyx, uh, one of which is gluteus maximus. And uh, I know for me, um, some of the therapies that they suggest for, uh, for the coccydinia is internal coccygeal manual therapy, where uh, the physiotherapist or the chiropractor uh, or the osteopath will put on a glove, put you prone, uh, use a block to kind of stabilize you, and then go internal into your anal uh, opening, and then pull the coccyx into a one direction or the other. And this is definitely a treatment that I had done. And so if you see the coccyx here, uh, the person will go into the anus and then they'll start to move this around. Sometimes they'll take a radiograph first to see if you have anything broken uh, and, or subluxated, which means off-centered, uh, not quite dislocated, but maybe just off of its normal alignment. And typically they find in the studies that an A to P push, like pushing from anterior to posterior, is the one a lot of people need because the coccyx will be bent a little bit anteriorly and maybe even off to one side. I had six of these done uh, by one of the best chiropractors in the world. He's wonderful. Um, unfortunately, um, it didn't really give me relief and I really wanted it to. I wanted it to work. Uh, for me, I was a non-responder. In the research, it's, it's you know come and go for the people that actually respond to it. It seems that people that have uh, uh, more traumatic versions uh, of this don't really respond as well to the internal. Uh, I was one of those. I fell directly on my coccyx, so uh, I didn't. But other, I've, I've talked to other people that have had internal coccygeal adjustments, and they were traumatic, and they did great. So I think that you, it might be multidisciplinary. It might be more complicated than just doing an internal release. And um, maybe some you know, myofascial treatments and myofascial therapy alongside that would work. And so in ID, we don't really coach people through the internal coccygeal adjustments because you know, it's really a little bit out of the scope of what we're interested in teaching you. We, we mostly like self-empowerment and what you can do on your own to help yourself. And w the way I responded the most was through gluteus maximus training along with that pelvic floor training. And uh, I, I responded a lot to femoral centration and, and being able to take pressure off the pelvic floor through movement around muscles that attach like piriformis, uh, gluteus maximus, things that attach to the sacrum and to the upper parts of the coccyx. And so gluteus maximus, a lot of people don't remember that it attaches to the coccyx. And Danny has shown that it does here. It has a pretty good attachment to the coccyx. Uh, and Danny's also created a, a beautiful piece of art here. It's on a video that I'll share with you. Um, he did it for uh, the piriformis so that people can better understand it. Um, and I just wanted to freeze frame it here. So look at all the ligamentous structures. These are all possibly nociceptive. And so coccydinia can result from changes in chemicals, right? Like oxytocin, uh, estrogen, progesterone. Uh, they're all receptors and located in relative to this area. And so people can develop coccydinia from uh, uh, things like hormone changes. Um, these, uh, coccydinia is also linked to the obese. There's quite a bit of research that points to diabetics having more coccydinia. Diabetics have more pain in general. So uh, the moral of the story is, is don't let your diabetes go unchecked and definitely try to prevent it if you can. If you have a familial incidence like me, you definitely want to uh, you know, do anything you can to, to stop that because your, your history of pain is going to increase pretty much with everything. But with coccydinia, it's, it's included in that category. So being obese and being um, a female being uh, someone who uh, has maybe hormonal fluctuations and someone who has diabetes, all those people can increase their chances of coccydinia, especially the non-traumatic kind. So, uh, so know your risks, right? And do whatever you can to help stabilize this area. Well, how do you stabilize ligaments? You can do prolotherapy. You can do injections on ganglion impar for sure. And ID, we focus a little bit more on stabilizing this area through core stability motor control and then femoral centration. So we're basically trying to stabilize the SI joint, we're stabilizing the femur, and trying to stabilize the, the lumbar spine because lumbosacral and um, uh, basically lumbar in general degeneration 
is linked to coccidemia. There's nice research to support that. So you can see piriformis here. You know, everybody calls everything in your butt cheek piriformis. Look how very little is actually piriformis. It's, it's a very, very small amount. And so Danny's drawn this extremely accurately, what Dr. Folkmore and I have seen many, many times in the lab. And I know that Danny's dissected for himself. So, um, you know, piriformis is not the only one to blame with something like coccidemia, although it should be included in one of the many things that are, that are a part of that. So I thought Danny's art was pretty perfect for all of that. Um, so, uh, moral of the story is in ID, we tend to create core stability to stabilize the center of mass because lumbar disc degeneration is linked to coccidemia and poor force transfer is as well. Uh, we also uh, work on femoral centration and SI joint stability to make sure those ligaments stay as stable as possible. Now, I know Dr. Folkmore is going to have a lot to say on that as well as systemic hormonal stabilization with insulin, estrogen, progesterone, and oxytocin, uh, because she is just masterful, not just with anatomy, but masterful with systemic reasons for why we experience pain, like via chemo reception. So Anna, do you want to, do you want to hit on that? Sure. Let's see. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I was, I was just thinking about it as you were speaking and, um, I, I've never been more thankful for my own pelvic floor dysfunctions and pelvic floor uh, discomfort than I am when we are sharing our stories with people in the ID courses because, um, you know, we otherwise could have fallen through the cracks of um, more traditional modalities of, you know, well, here's the protocol for, for pelvic pain. And, um, and, and what I find particularly with some of the um, uh, coccygeal manipulations is that if, if that's something that's part of your patient's care, then that's, that's great. That's fine. Um, it works really, really nicely when you're co-managing and co-caring with these practitioners. So I know that I'll have patients that will come in after a, um, a manipulation so that we can stabilize the manipulation that was just made. And that way things aren't, you know, essentially what you have are things pulling in different directions, right? They're not quite sure where their center is, where the equilibrium is. And so you've got this sort of push pull force in structures of the pelvis and, and it, you know, the body yields to that, um, particularly if there's been trauma. So um, it's really nice to be able to stabilize and sort of set a manipulation after it's already, you know, happened so that they don't have to continue to have it, you know, push back into place. These are things that actually they can do to extend that treatment and, and really help stabilize this on their own. Um, where it gets really interesting is if you notice that some of the pain is either postpartum, um, which postpartum guys i have to say I, I postpartum isn't the time that the us gives you um off of work <laughs> postpartum is you know we see levels of relaxin and oxytocin and all of these things elevated for at least a year after uh childbirth so postpartum is a a significant time even after the mother has started menstruating again um it's you can absolutely still be considered postpartum so first things first i think we need to start to redefine that and have uh these discussions with our patients on what postpartum actually is because i feel like it is overlooked and you know women are are really powerful and childbearing and childbirth is this amazing thing um but there is a recovery time afterwards. And so when you start to notice coccygeal discomfort and pelvic discomfort that it becomes cyclical or is in a postpartum um, uh, period, then that's when we need to start looking at, okay, what is the storyboard here? What is this narrative? What is, what is the cycles like? Um, what is the patient's menstrual cycle like? And where does their pain sort of fit into that narrative? Um, and, and that gives us a little bit of information about what the influx of excessive movement looks Looks like, um, you know, particularly if it's a time where um, maybe their diet is a little bit off, or um, you know, their their diet also happens to have changed. Maybe they're consuming a lot more uh, dairy products or something like that. Dairy is a really interesting thing. It it serves a lot of of nutrients for us, and it can be a really wonderful food. But it is also one of the highest forms of um, exogenous hormones that we can take in. And so maybe there's a relationship with dairy that needs to be looked at there um, when there's systemic pain like that 
particularly if it's cyclical or hormonal related. Um, so, you know, we can address this from a movement perspective, from a stability perspective, but then when we really start to take a deeper dive into what their experience is like with this discomfort, we can start to fit it in with all of the other puzzle pieces around it and get a really nice understanding of this person's experience and what has brought them into our office and how we can sort of understand what they're going through and then help them from there. You know, we, in ID, we always say meet someone where they are and take them where they're not. And um, it's not a straightforward protocol because we're individuals and this is, um, um, this is individualized medicine. This is really understanding what a person is going through and um, and how we can best support them. I love it, Anna. That was perfect. And it's so funny that you mentioned that because the, the second question of the day, we'll, we'll come back to what Dr. Folkmer is talking about in hormones and systemic inflammation that will, it's ironically the next question. <laughs> I, I, they were two completely different people too, which is, is wonderful that uh, people are on the same kind of lens. Um, the... Uh, do, uh, I lost Danny. I don't know where he went. Did you see if he? he oh, he's here. On? Okay, he went off my. Yeah, he's here. Okay, Danny. Um, did you want to add anything in? Okay. Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. No. Just. Uh, I just think that that was just pretty interesting hearing hearing all that bit there. I think think this might be something that's a little bit a little bit out of my scope to properly <laughs> properly comment on here, but. Uh, but you it was it was really interesting to ask that much. So <laughs> you draw it a lot, so. and you can probably validate because you do so much art on the coccyx. How very many things you have to draw in relationship to the coccyx that most people kind of ignore. Well, it, well, it's definitely interesting. Well, I guess in that sense, like it definitely is interesting how it's such a relatively small structure, but so many things do have attachments to it. Uh, you know, creating tension, creating pulling from multi different angles and multi different facets. So it would it, it would totally make sense with that, like being able to. Uh, you know, be, be able to assess structures, assess things to just balance out and make sure that not, not one thing is pulling harder more than another or creating more tension in, in one in one plane versus the other and, and treating it that, that way. That's, that's exactly, I, that was my experience, Danny. Like, um, I, I, I didn't, it wasn't until this incredible, incredible guy, it was, uh, my coccygeal injury was 2008 and I hadn't, I hadn't sat comfortably in, I guess it was two years. And then Dr. Eric Dixon was my intern. Uh, he's this incredible chiropractor. Unfortunately, he passed away early um, in a car accident. And he was really a dear colleague of mine. I, I, I miss him dearly. He, he was the one who showed me that a lot of my pain, even though I had a traumatic injury, my lumbar spine was really, really mobile. And like what Danny was saying about a part that like not being able to share load, like not being able to share the, the efforts, and I, w I was basically using my erectors, my lumbar spine, to kind of pull me through parts of my gait mechanism. And when I would sit, I would be so uncomfortable because I had so much inflammation around my coccyx and I was getting like quite a bit of neural pull. And, uh, and then, you know, Eric, it's, he was like, I don't know if you should just be looking at your coccyx. Definitely look at it. But I think you should look at how you actually move through your lumbar spine because I think it's not, it's setting you up for failure. And what he had found was that I was going into a hyperlordosis. I was going into like too big of a curve at L4 and, uh, and it was yanking and pulling on some of the nerves that were going down to my gluteus maximus. And so I couldn't contract it because the nerves were, it's like stepping on a hose. And so as much as I was trying to use my gluteus maximus, I couldn't, and then it would get stretched and it would pull on my coccyx. So no matter how many times I got adjusted, it would just get pulled out again every time I would walk out of the office. And so that was like devastating because not only is it really an invasive procedure, I would do it. I would do it 50 times over if it meant that I was going to get lasting results. But the problem is, is that it would feel kind of okay. And then, you know, it just didn't last. And then you're really, it's really hard to get like an internal coccygeal adjustment six times and then it not hold and that you feel kind of desperate after that. And then you can get pretty depressed. And then we all know what depression can do for your amplification of pain. So it was a really frustrating time in my life. And then Eric, you know, started doing some, you know, the neural developmental stuff, uh, similar to what we do with, with ID. And uh, basically my solution was learning how to lunge. And I didn't find lunging comfortable my whole life and learning how to load share between my lumbar spine, my sacral iliac joint, my, my hip centration. Still to this day, I'm like, I kind of search for that coccygeal pain just to kind of see <laughs> if it's still there. And I'm like, no, you're okay. You can sit. <laughs> but there was a time period where I couldn't sit at all. And it, it's, 
gosh, you know, if you, you name it, I've had it. That's, that's the nature of we people that have went into rehab. We just want to help ourselves in a very selfish way. And then we want to share that knowledge with the world. So uh, what Danny said is really on point. Uh, Karen, do you have any experience with coccidinia to share with us? Um, no, no experience on that, but, but I, I, I do, you know, would like to just talk about, um, you know, the ID coursework and, and this is why I believe it's, it's super important. Um, you know, just everything that you said, that you and Anna's talked about and Danny talked about, um, you know, when someone's doing something, like looking at everything that they're doing, not just, um, that one particular, you know, treatment they may be having, you know, explaining to them, like, what's going on like behind the scenes like you know the stability aspect of it and um just you know giving someone some clear-cut things on what they can do if something happens again in the future because let's face it we're we're not static people we're we're very dynamic we're always moving and things are going to happen life's going to get in the way we're going to get stressed or you know we we could trip on a rock whatever the case may be but we're at least we're going to have some kind of solution as to what we can go back to um, and we're just, we're just not confined by like being in a box anymore. And, and that's why I just, I love ID, um, and coursework. Um, it's just, it's such educational. It, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's looking at the whole picture. It's, it's not just focusing in on, um, one thing. And, um, so for, for that aspect, it, you know, really could apply to, to anything, not just the coccinia. That's true. Uh, yeah with that 100 percent yeah i think so much for saying that karen um I, I think that that's you know that that wide angle lens that we try to encourage people to have um we we don't keep the id courses open to one particular type of therapist or clinician because everybody's got really valuable tools in their toolbox and um you know one of the benefits to a wide angle lens is that when you start to talk about um, systemic inflammation or things like that, but it's condition specific. It's like, okay, well, there might be, you know, there, there might be a systemic story going on just in terms of, of inflammation, but why did it settle in this particular region? And that's a lot of times where the biomechanics will start to play a role in this sort of systemic story. But, um, you know, like, like gout, for example, like, okay, well, there's a uric acid imbalance. Why is it only affecting this one toe? Or why is it this? Or why is it that? And, and so when you start to see, the body being selective about where it's focusing uh, a symptomatology, I think that that's a really nice way to be inclusive with our care and, and have, you know, so many different practitioners and clinicians tackling a problem and understanding it from all of their angles and then trying to say, okay, now this is how we can better help this person through co-caring, through, you know, a, a marrying these ideas of functional medicine with biomechanics, you know, with rehab strategies that are going to only make your systemic you know changes that you're working on just help you're going to help them get even better and you can sort of take these problems and or the, these solutions and direct them to a specific region of the body so um, I, I really love that you've gotten that, that out of the courses Karen and that that you mentioned that because that's exactly what you know we want for people and we want to, to just sort of make this a, a one big happy family for people <laughs> Very, very true. Uh, we had a question also uh, about like osteopenia, osteoporosis, but that was covered in a previous Ask Us Anything. So if you guys ever want to watch and ask us anything again, they're under our Immaculate Dissection Facebook page and the topics that are covered are listed in the post. So you can enjoy that on our Facebook page. Uh, and if you, if you really can't find it for some reason, you can just private message uh, Dr. Folkmer, uh, Danny, or myself and we'll help you find it. Okay. Um, uh, another question that we had that was sent to us uh, prior to the talk was uh, about uh, spinal pain, full spinal pain that happens premenstrually and that is alleviated by menstruation. And so uh, this, this person that was experiencing this uh, is totally understanding how much estrogen plays a role in pain. <laughs> and it's a pretty big role. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of research articles. I, I pulled it for coccidinia too, but uh, I'll pull them up here uh, just to kind of share with you um, about like estrogen and pain. Pardon me a second. There we go. Uh, this article is really nice. Uh, nope, not that one. 
this one right here, uh, that estrogen levels, the fluctuating estrogen levels are hugely connected to something called neurogenic inflammation. And so a lot of people, because the spine is covered with dura mater and dura mater is very, very neurosensitive. It's highly, highly innervated. Unlike the pia and the arachnoid mater, the dura mater it really wants you to know where you are in space. <laughs> so it has a lot of proprioception and, and, and lots of nociception associated with it. And so um, each one of the spinal nerves, all the way from your, your first spinal nerve segment, all the way down to your last coccygeal segment, these areas are surrounded by dural sleeves. So all these, these uh, nerve roots are covered in a sleeve of dura mater that links you from the inside of your cranium all the way down to your coccyx. And uh, because of that, they are extremely pain sensitive. And when estrogen starts to do the sharp decline, right, it's high and then maybe makes a sharp decline, it can uh, definitely be associated with, um, with levels of um, inflammatory issues. Uh, and it definitely increases your chances of pain. So if the person already started out with a spinal stability problem, which is a lot of people, and then they have like uh, hormonal levels, and Anna was just talking about how like dairy gives you a lot of exogenous estrogen, or maybe um, estrogen has been linked very, very much to premenstrual symptoms and migraine and uh, what Anna would probably call blood stasis. Uh, and uh, in trying to get things moving is actually quite challenging. Then the estrogen and progesterone will drop you know, premenstrually, and when you have that quick drop, there can be an enormous amount of, um, of discomfort associated with neurogenic inflammation. So this is a really nice article that discusses the mechanism of that and the receptors that are used. So if you're a sciencey person, you'll love that. Uh, this is also another article that I pulled up about just hormones and their interaction with the pain experience. And, and estrogen, of course, is listed at the top of that. So it is tough to be a lady. It always has been and always will be. Not, not to say anything's wrong with you gents, of course. It's difficult for you guys too. And being a male is probably not a party either. But when it comes to um, pain afferents, uh, women are built to experience a little bit more and that may have something to do with the fact that we give birth and that's the equivalency of breaking 23 bones at once uh, when that head passes through the vagina. So ladies, call your mothers, especially if she gave vaginal delivery and even if she was C-section, still gets a medal. Uh, all medals to all women giving birth. It's an enormous amount of discomfort associated with it. And so there's a lot of uh, postulate in the research that estrogen is, has this role in pain because we're trying to prepare the woman to deal with the amount of pain that labor takes so it doesn't kill her. Um, when it comes to balancing out the hormones, you have to think of those exogenous sources. I know for me personally, when I stopped eating as much you know, meat, that is a very controversial topic. And, and I you know, eat very little dairy, but uh, those things really helped me balance my own hormones out and made my periods more tolerable and made my spinal pain a little bit worse, especially my migraines. So those might play a role with people, especially with uh, what's called implosion headaches, like a vice grip type of, of migraine level headaches uh, that are premenstrual or during menses. Um, the, uh, the Getting estrogen checked can actually be more than just blood work. You can actually do saliva testing and urine testing in something called a uh, hypothalamic uh, pituitary axis testing. And uh, there's, they're still quite controversial, but uh, I don't know, like it, it's worth looking into to see if, if possibly you can match your blood work to urinalysis and saliva testing. Uh, a lot of functional medicine doctors do that as well as nutritionists. And, and I know Anna probably does those as well. And looking at those levels all together and, and, and checking maybe your blood work at different times of your period can be really interesting uh, because what you read on you know, day one of your period may be very different on day 15. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, blood, shot, uh, blood work is a snapshot in time. So it should always be used as a baseline in comparison with other things. So tracking your menses, uh, if you're a female, and, and being able to look to see if you might be able to stabilize some of those hormone levels can be really, really effective. I know for me, uh, I was guided to take a, a therapy called DIM, which is uh, a therapy that helps you to you know, pick up excess estrogen or even balance out normal levels of estrogen, which is also a dramatic different change for me as far as the way that my my menstrual pain uh, was happening through the spine and, and through the back and through the neck. Uh, big, big game changer. So you can do research on DIM, uh, do research on uh, maybe a plant-based diet to help you normalize hormones. Uh, and, and it can be a real game changer. I know Dr. Fulcher probably has a lot to say about this. So let me just pin her video. Um, oh, man. <laughs> Do we have another hour, Kathy Dooley? <laughs> um, so this one's a really fun topic because 
Um, you know, estrogen is, estrogen is one of the things that helps build up an endometrium. Estrogen by nature tends to be kind of cloying and clotting. And this is why people have to be careful about, um, uh, you know, oral contraceptive pills and smoking and things like that, because um, estrogen can induce blood stasis, which Chinese medicine looks at as a, um, pain causing sort of pattern. Um, I mean, you think about, you know, just like having these sort of vascular changes in your body where you literally get like a vascular traffic jam. Um, and then your body has to kind of try to move that, which is why cramping is no day at the beach, um, because your body's trying to move that. And so, um, there's, you know, the other thing about it is that estrogen and progesterone are often doing different things in the cycle. And so, Estrogen is going to give you that really fun sort of blood stasis pattern. Um, progesterone kind of tricks your body into thinking it's running warmer than it is. Um, it, it tends to, when you have estrogen that's raising as, or excuse me, progesterone that's raising while estrogen is dropping, it can sort of trick your hypothalamus into thinking that you're running a little bit warmer. And this is why people will tend to get night sweats that are, um, or hot flashes. Um, you know, it, at, it, during menopause or perimenopausal time where you have an estrogen drop and a progesterone that increases, now you all of a sudden think you're running warmer. And so that kind of, you know, the, the heat that your body's feeling can also affect certain um, uh, pain presentations. But the other thing about it is kind of what I was saying about the systemic effects and then the sort of like mechanical locality of it. Um, when someone has a systemic problem, but it's affecting, like why does someone cramp down the front of their thighs? Why does someone cramp in their abdomen? Why does someone cramp in the back? This is where correctives paired with systemic um, changes and influences can really, really help take a systemic problem and the locality that it's sort of fixating on and tie them up really nicely together and help create some resolution. Because um, you and I may have the same, um, you know, sort of estrogen progesterone fluctuations, but they may hit us very differently. And so that's where I think that the individualization of a good assessment of good biomechanical assessment, in addition to the data that you're already collecting from what their systemic experience is like, can really help individualize your treatment and care for a person. Um, because I mean, we know the general characteristics of estrogen and progesterone, but the way that they sort of hit one person versus another can be very different. Um, and the, the missing piece there, that sort of missing puzzle piece may be down to how that person is moving. Um, and what we find is that patients that do their corrective exercises during menstruation have less cramping. And, you know, some of this is because they're moving, they're circulating their hormones a little bit better. Nothing is starting to kind of stagnate. Um, I even change my patients programming a little bit with their workout so that they're moving things when they need to be moving and they're trying to help stagnate and, and tonify things maybe right after um, menstruation. But, um, you know, premenstrually, we're, we're building an endometrium. We're supposed to be sort of stagnating things there. But if things are excessively stagnating throughout the body, they may just feel a little louder. And so we can kind of help, you know, balance that out a little bit so that it's not too much of a presentation for the patient to be able to, to deal with. Because, you know, when you start experiencing the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic effects of just going through pain, that's really interesting too, because um, your body has to sort of counter the pain signals that you're feeling with an equal and opposite force. But that's when people will start having stuff like syncope episodes and vomiting episodes just because they're, they're trying to kind of counter the, the nervous system effects of how to downregulate pain. Your body is really good at trying to take care of you, but sometimes it can create a dramatic presentation. This is why you'll see people pass out when they're in pain, but it, for a lot of people in their menstruation, um, they will you know, experience times where they're vomiting and passing out during their period. And it's because they're actually in a lot of pain. It may not even be registering consciously that they're in pain, but you're having that equal and opposite reaction of their nervous system trying to help them through that pain and downregulate some of the nociceptive factors. Um, but it, it ultimately results in things like blood pressure dropping and, and stuff like that. So um, this is a really fun topic. Like I said, we, we need a whole nother hour at least. So maybe we'll <laughs> include it on the collaborative. No, it's one more collaborative talk. Now, Danny has yeah. 
like incredible art on like the thoracic diaphragm. And he actually recently did a video on uh, the effects of the diaphragm during um, – uh, on the aorta, and the aorta is splitting into common iliac vessels that then give internal iliac vessels that feed the uterus, and amongst other things. And so all of that that pressure on stagnating blood when the estrogen is kind of getting high and building up that endometrium can be alleviated. A lot of that cramping can be alleviated through breathing training. Danny, do you want to speak a little bit about the video that you made about like posture and the diaphragm and then the the uh, aortic hiatus? Let's see. Can you hear? Uh, yeah. No, but yeah, no. So I mean, if you got a, if you got a three out of them, you have these uh, these tissues that are able, to, you know, to con contract and, and expand, you know, as as is with muscles. And uh, when when you have structures like the diaphragm, where you have some major major vessels and uh, structures that are passing through it, if you know that that uh, diaphragm is going to be particularly tight and it's going to be pinching off and choking off some of those structures, it's going to lead to some of that stagnation, so some of that holdup and whatnot from not allowing things to move through as freely, not allowing things to move as, as efficiently as they normally would be. So when you get into positions where you know biomechanics are kind of taken as, as priority, moving properly, moving the way that it should be, uh, taking some of that tension and some of that pressure off of uh, major vessels, vessels that provide blood, uh, uh, the passage of blood, so on and so forth. Um, that's that's really going to open the doors for 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 a lot more proper functioning and, and a lot less problems down the road. Perfect. If you guys missed Danny's uh, video on this on our YouTube, I'm sorry, it's on our uh, Instagram and on our Facebook page, and you'll see Danny right there. You can't miss it. And it's a fantastic video where he talks about uh, the anatomy of the thoracic diaphragm, which is controlling the circulation that Anna was talking about, and that Danny uh, shows you how he changes his own posture. And when you're in pain, you'll get in the posture of pain, right? You'll start to accessory breathe. You'll do things that are maybe not going to be so great as far as your outcome. And that's the relationship that things can have with syncope and, and nausea. And, and, and Danny goes over all the anatomy of that with the diaphragm hiatuses so it's definitely worth a watch you should watch Danny's video on it it's pretty fantastic and uh, I think I have an article on my uh, website too about the diaphragm hiatuses so if you guys are interested in that stuff you just got to email us and we'll send you over some support materials because uh, we want to be a, a support for you to understand some of these topics a little bit better but uh, nothing beats a, a good systemic evaluation of what can encourage um, uh, estrogen hormonal imbalance as well as being able to control it with spinal stability and move that, that blood and, and chi uh, during a, a period of stasis. Uh, loved all those uh, discussions. So we're running a little short on time, so I just want to cover one last question. Um, uh, the question's from the gallery. Uh, I love this question, and I love this question, and the person's going to be very excited that there's a YouTube video uh, from us on this. So the person says um, she has, or he or she has been taking a ID one cues, neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, hips even for good spinal stability. And they're noticing instinctively that people want to arch their neck on a lot of compound movements that they note, uh, deadlifts, squats, kettlebell swings. Yeah, I agree with all that. Uh, why do we do it is the big question. Why do people do that? Uh, the best and easiest answer is because they have to. Uh, people will do that instinctively to encourage the weight to come up. They're trying to encourage lordosis to occur, to buttress any axial compressive loads or ground force contact up to the feet. Uh, they don't have to do it that way. They, they are doing it that way because they have to in that moment. It's, it's what their body is trained to kind of understand. Unfortunately, it breaks the system down because as soon as you start to do this, you can hyperlordose the neck. You can hyperlordose the back. Where your neck goes, your low back is going. You can even feel it. You can put your hand behind your back and then put yourself a neck extension and you'll feel your low back moving into your hand. Lordosis for lordosis, kyphosis for kyphosis. So the lumbar and cervical lordoses are earned first during that picking up the head, prone propping, baby on the elbow. They're trying to coordinate these curves that you earn. You don't earn initially your kyphoses, your thoracic kyphoses and your sacral kyphosis. You were gifted those <laughs> in the fetal position in the womb. And then you have to earn the other ones so that you can handle uh, axial compressive loads and ground force contact. Uh, so that makes those, that S curve of the spine and the sagittal plane that helps us take three times more axial compressive loads than a straight spine would. So uh, people do it because they have to. But I want you to see this video of me failing abysmally at squatting well when my neck is an extension. So it's one of my early uh, 
episodes of teaching for neurokinetic therapy. Uh, it's a manual muscle testing course. And you can see this person's having me do it. I think it's my very first course ever, <laughs> which is, uh, look at young Dooley there. Oh my gosh, uh, how she's changed. But you, what you'll see is this person actually putting me into a squat position and then having me go into neck extension. And uh, he's demonstrating how this is going to kill my squat. It's going to kill my power. So he has me in a really good squat position. I'm not a bad squatter. He's got a hand on the sacrum. And my neck is currently neutral. And you can see how easy I can go up. And now he's going to have me go into neck extension. And now watch how I can't get up. <laughs> I don't think there's a better way to actually see that in action than duly failing abysmally at doing it. So you know what the person's gonna do? You know what I would have done to get out of that situation? I would have done girl in the club, okay? I would have gone into an excessive hyperextension, loaded my knees excessively, put excessive weight into my forefoot, not used my glutes and my hamstrings to get me out of the hole. I would have used anything. I would have used my neck to get me out of the hole. And it's just not going to work. It's not going to work without the system experiencing breakdown. So people are doing it in that moment because they have to, because they don't know another way. But don't let yourself believe that you have to in order to get out of that hole. Uh, neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, hips even is validating that you can actually create a patent pathway for the lumbosacral area, for those nerves to come out and get to those crucial pieces of, of tissue like the glute, the hamstrings, to be able to pull you out of that squat position. If you feel like you have to go into neck extension, that weight's going forward. It's going into the front of your feet and you're gonna use the quads to primarily get you out of the hole, which, hole, which means knee extension. That's why people think that squatting is bad for the knees. It's not bad for the knees. It's bad if you only use your knees. And certainly you're gonna use only your knees if you're gonna go into neck extension. So be very, very careful about maintaining those IDQs. There's no squat that's worth you going into neck extension for. Your neck is naturally extended. And so if you need help with this, get a pole on your back. Get a pole on your back and make sure you can maintain the pole at the back of the head, between the shoulder blades, and at the top of the sacrum. We do this in our ID1, or sorry, ID2 coursework, where we won't let you squat unless you can prove to us that you can get on the floor and be in a quadruped squat position, and that you can keep the pole on your neck and walk up with it. Anna and I demonstrate this at every single ID2 course, and there's very seldomly a person in the class that can do that with efficiency without, you know, either moving away from the pole, uh, girl in the club in it, you know, putting too much pressure in the wrong place. Dr. Fulmer, you teach the squat portion of, of ID2. You want to piggyback on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we put people in quadruped and try to clear them for a squat because a quadruped is a regressed squat. And if, you know, when they're that close chain and have four points of contact, of, oh, at least four, six points of contact, because you've got the toes in addition to the knees, um, when they're in the, when they're on the floor closed down like that and they can't maintain their spinal neutral, you have no chance of being able to do that once you're upright and then have gravity working against you. So we train the squat from all fours. Um, and, and it's only after a certain point with, you know, get passing through by uh, bilateral symmetrical lunges and things like that too. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the pole trick is really, really great um, because we, we do sort of show people exactly where their little vulnerabilities and, and their areas that they can work on are um, of just helping to keep a person honest. And, and it's always really funny because, you know, you can feel it. And it's, it's kind of one of those situations where you start to get kind of competitive with yourself. And you're like, hold on, let me try this again. I, I, I felt it. I felt myself slip a little bit. Um, the because of the the if kyphosis is maintained in the right spot and lordosis is maintained in the right spot then your points of contact up against the pole will all be there and you shouldn't actually lose them um that you can catch things like a butt wink and a squat really early on just from how someone walks up from a quadruped position um so these are really really fun things and and you know the person isn't under as much load so it's a very safe thing to kind of test so that you don't have to wait and test them later when they are upright. Um, so I love this test. This one is phenomenal. And I, I love that video, Kathy. I'd never seen that video before. That one was really, really awesome. I loved seeing that. Um, so oh, yeah. That old video, man. I miss your headband. I know, right? <laughs> I back. Uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot say enough at how 
your, your everything will change for you. Everything will change for you once you start to learn the importance of neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, hips even. And if, yes, of course you can go into neck extension. You can do it. It's just, it's going to have a consequence <laughs> if you're constantly doing it. The person that asked the question also talked about handstands. And this is a really, a, we had an amazing uh, handstand specialist from GMB. Her name is uh, Kirsty Grossart. She was at our uh, uh, ID1. It was at Toronto, Anna, I believe. Um, she had come to Australia to do it. Australia, that's right. She was in Australia yeah. teaching a handstand workshop that we took. And she was really great. She talked about, like, instead of going into neck extension, that ID had encouraged her to start looking over the eyebrows and to work on keeping her neck long chin tucked and how much harder it was. And for me, like if I do, I, I didn't like handstands for a very long time because it would just increase my migraines and it would increase so much tension in my neck. And then when I started doing neck long chin tucked, it's a way harder to do a handstand, but it felt so much better. So people with neck issues, they don't usually like to do handstands because it not only increases the intracranial pressure, but they, they're locking down. I'm always just thinking of vertebral artery. I know Anna is too. Like the more you're like this, even if you're an incredible gymnast or an incredible athlete, the more you're like this, I'm just thinking about the vertebral arteries taking a 90 degree turn at that, that uh, lateral occipital joint. I don't know if that's a good idea to just be all the time, you know, uh, it, it's the, the reason why when you go to a hair salon, a lot of the sinks have cutouts in them for you to slide your neck back. And so you can keep your neck long chin tuck so you don't stroke out. You never know who could have, you know, um, I've had patients with vertebral artery dissections that uh, they may have connective tissue disorder. Some of them don't. And some of them were just holding their head in capital extension, looking at fireworks and stuff like that. And then boom, uh, they can have, I mean, I just don't want one of my patients to be in that category of, possibility, even if it's not a probability. But I just wanted to show you this screen share. Some people are really, really good at doing handstands with their neck long chin tucked, and some of them are divers. Like not all divers do it, but if you look at this diver right here, do you see this? Look at that. That's neck long chin tucked, chest wide, ribs down, if I've ever seen it. That's IDQ central. That's way freaking harder than putting your head back. It just is. It's really tough to get that kind of body line. So when I'm working on handstands, either against a wall or by myself, I won't let my neck go into excessive extension because I know it's going to give me a headache. It just it will. And so this, I practice like this and I don't get headaches and I can enjoy the handstand a lot more. And so I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. ID would never say that. But if you have a neck discomfort, it might be a way for you to try to do it. I mean, you don't really see a ton of gymnasts doing this, you know, in the Olympics. A lot of them are neck extension because that's the way that they were coached. But if I had a, a patient that came to me and they were complaining of that neck tension, I would say, is there any way we can train this into you? If not, it's okay. We'll, we'll do pendulums and we'll try to get you out of it. But if, if we could just train people to do this at the start when they're young, we might not have to deal with as much of the, the neck problems that they have when they're older. This is not an area you want to mess with. Your neck is majorly controlling equilibrium, cervicogenic headaches can result, uh, a, a lot of problems with the vestibulars uh, can, uh, can result, concussions can result. I can't tell you how many gymnasts I've treated with concussions because their head was flipping backwards instead of being aligned and they didn't know how to dissociate their eyes from their head and they end up hitting their head on something. And so I think a part of it is whipping the head back instead of you know keeping a relative load share uh, across. But you know, how are you going to argue with some really great coaches? It's really hard. So you meet the clinician. I'm just trying to meet someone where they're at and help take them where they're not to do our best. But that's why you see it happening. You see it happening because other people were coached into it. It's what they know. It's what they have to do in order to, for them to feel uh, acceptably stable. But it's not the only way to do it. And you can certainly, I've trained myself out of doing things uh, the poor way. If I can do it, I am not a prime athlete. I know I can get a prime athlete to do it. Uh, Karen, I know you have lots of things to say about this because uh, Karen, what, what do you think about the, the neck malposition? Well, <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think it's going to affect everything and um, you know, every, everything you do, it's going to affect. And um, you know, I like how you mentioned the lady that um, does the handstands, how she said when she put herself in a, in a in better alignment that she noticed that it was more difficult. And um, I, I would agree with that myself because when I started, um, you know, putting myself in, in better positioning, I noticed it was more difficult to do things. And, um, you know, I just continued to work on it. And I, and I found that, you know, very, very valuable. And, 
you know, you, you, you really can't afford to lose any of the IDQs. It's like you, if you keep your neck long and your chin tucked, then you have to make sure you keep the chest wide and the ribs, you know, pull down. You know, all the cues have to be in check. You can't sacrifice one for another. Um, which I think is, is, is super important. And, you know, I'm going to sound like a broken record here again, but that's why I believe the um, ID coursework is, is so valuable because, you know, just taking them all, I mean, you don't have to take them in any order, but it, it really gets into, you know, how to build, how to build this and why it's very important. And, um, you know, cause a lot of times when people like maybe they want to exercise or they just want to learn how to do squats or, or, um, deadlifts and stuff like that there's a lot that goes into building that and it's not just a matter of move your leg this way or put your butt that way or put your head this way it's it's not that you, you have to learn how to feel that what that feels like it's not so much someone telling you or showing you or or talking about it it's really getting into the nitty-gritty yourself and feeling it and building on it and and that's what i just I feel is just so important. And, um, I believe ID does a, an awesome job at, um, you know, really, um, helping people understand that. Karen, you're also, uh, you, you are someone who works really, really hard on their neck, long chin, tuck, chest, wide position. I, I I've seen few people work harder than you. Uh, I know I've worked really hard on it because it's been a source of a lot of my afferents in my life, a, a pain afferent. Yeah. And uh, you work your butt off on this and you've gotten so good at it. What do you think is your secret? I just, I just do it all the time. I mean, I, I make it part of my life and um, I've changed just how I do everyday activities. So it's not just like when I'm downstairs, if I'm exercising or whatever, I'm doing working out, working on the get up. I'm always incorporating it into my daily life. So I'm not, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not saying I'm like, you know, crazy about it, but it's just, it's becoming natural like how I'm doing things, how I'm sitting, um, you know, how am I sitting at a computer? Um, like I carry all that I've learned with me in my daily activities, you know, right up until like when I'm driving in my car, you know, it's just, it's, it's not magic. It, it, it's retraining the movement pattern. And, um, you know, I, I, I just saw the benefit of it and, um, you know, it's just, right. I mean, that's the, yeah. I, mean, I love how you say it's not magic. It's not like poof. You no, know, it's definitely not magic. It's, it's learned behavior. Just, just like, if you don't think that you can unlearn something that doesn't work for you, you learn something that doesn't work for you. You are neuroplastic, you are beautiful, and you are human. You can 100% learn new things. I know Anna and I talk about, Anna's got this incredible patient in his 90s, right? And you teach him new stuff all the time. My, one of my best patients, and I don't like to, you know, say that they're better or worse, although Karen Ravelis, man, woo, I, I hope few people work as hard as you. But this other patient, man, he, he's 87, and I've never seen anyone work as hard as he. And if the, the first visit was the last visit when I had said, oh, you're 87. He's like, don't ever say it again. He didn't want to hear anything about his age, because he was not, it's not that he was in denial of it. It was just that he was like, I don't want to hear about any, I was like, I wasn't even going to say anything. I was just confirming that he was 87. But after that, it was all about his athleticism and his ability to create change. And he said to me, I can't believe I went so many years doing something a way that didn't work for me. And I was like, it's okay. It's not going to take as long for you to undo as it took for you or to, talk, uh, to, to unravel as it did for you to actually create the issue. It, it's the complete opposite of weight loss. Like it really is quicker to fix the pattern because you just learn the behavior, you create the neuroplastic activity, and you can change it. That's why you don't ever get a pass if you're elderly. You don't ever get a pass for any kind of chronic I issue you're going to give us. You're, you don't get a pass if you're a handstand athlete. You don't get a pass if you've learned it a certain way. You can learn a way that works better for you even though it may be more challenging. And so you have to find what works for you. If working for you in head extension on a handstand or a squat, if that works for you, okay. Just be prepared for the fact that, that is not load share and it may not work forever. And I don't want to be right about this. People will come to me later and say, you know, maybe two or three years down the road, they're like, remember when you told me about that neck thing? It totally is happening now. It's like you, you cursed me, Dooley. I'm like, geez, if I had that kind of power, then I would just curse everybody at the same time so that they would actually get over it at the same time. I don't have that kind of power. It's just truth. It's the anatomy. It's the way the anatomy works. So, so excited. Um, Anna, do you want to talk about your patient that's in his nineties? That's just like a dime, just a complete dynamo. Oh my God. Most compliant, hardworking patient I've ever seen. 
um, because, you know, he, he loves that uh, the movements that we do together are look simple and are so hard um, because he's having to really sort of tap into some of the stability and things like that. He's, I mean, he has military background. He has, you know, professional athlete background. Like he knows how to perform. He's, he's been very good at athleticism and performing. And um, for, you know, 96 going on 97 years now, which is like <laughs> all hail to this patient. And so whenever we put him through movements that seem simple and then all of a sudden he's you know experiencing something new at the you know ripe young age of 96 he is thrilled he's thrilled to learn something new he's thrilled to go through the neuroplasticity that takes place of refinding some of these stable points again and getting better acquainted with them because maybe he hasn't visited them in almost a century if if ever so um he's a really fascinating person for me to learn from and uh and and just the way that he approaches movement with such an open mind and curiosity and you know and and but also it's it's coming from a very authentic place too because he sees how much benefit he's getting from it and so finding these same cues, you know, nobody gets a pass. I put him through the same things that I put any of my other patients through, no matter what age. Uh, my youngest patient as of uh, quarantine shutdown was 14 months. My oldest was 97. So I don't care how old they are. They're going to go through the same exact things. And, um, and he's, a, he's a really, really honest feedback and, um, and really, really enjoys the work. So you got to wonder if that openness to neuroplasticity, that, that willingness to work is the reason why he's 96. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really, really inspiring to hear those stories. Uh, wonderful. Well, I think um, it's time for us to end because we didn't, I didn't realize that we have been on for a really long time. And so people probably want to go, but I mean, we could literally talk about this stuff forever. We are so excited to help you guys. So we have a different kind of thing for you tonight. Um, we have a $20 coupon off of the ID Collaborative. And Anna's got the coupon code ready for you. And so right now is the chance to use your chat box to test it out if you haven't yet tonight. And that's to the left of the share screen. If you don't already have an ID Collaborative membership, it's, it's $209, it's $200 and a $9 PayPal fee. And uh, we can save you 20 bucks off that, which means you're gonna get a minimum 52 talks. It's actually looking like it's gonna be closer to over 100 <laughs> the way that we're going, uh, which are gonna end up being somewhere between two and $4 a piece when this is all over. But you're actually gonna get it for 20 bucks off if you decide that you wanna do it. If you're the first to answer the question I'm gonna ask. So if you wanna ch check out your chat box, I'm only gonna use the chat box to, to use this contest. So if you wanna try it out just by saying hi or something, because the first person to answer correctly in the chat box to this question is going to get 20 bucks off their collaborative membership. So if they're ready, okay, no one's using it. So I'm going to take it that everybody understands how to use the chat box. Here we go. Okay. The first person to answer in the chat box correctly, get the $20 off coupon. Here we go. Name three structures that attach to the coccyx. Any three structures. Go. For our coccydinia question. Are you guys excited? I'm excited. Either they're thinking. Oh no, did I, did I ask out too hard of a one? We have a winner, Audrey. Audrey, yes. Glute max, coccygeus, levator ani. Woohoo! So what you wanna do is a message, oh, Dr. Falkenberg, do you mind putting your email address, immaculatedissection at gmail.com? Uh, you wanna email, and she will send over your coupon for 20 bucks off the ID Collaborative membership. And so hopefully uh, you guys uh, can come back next week for your chance to win a coupon off of one of our courses. We're pretty excited to give you free money just for showing up and answering a question correctly. If you didn't win this week, it's okay. Come back, share some anatomy knowledge. You at least leave with some knowledge, right? And I'm gonna post this call on YouTube. We're going to post it tomorrow. It's going to be on the Immaculate Dissection uh, Facebook page. It's also on my YouTube, uh, DR Duly Noted. 
so uh, check out the Immaculate Dissection Facebook page tomorrow if you want to go back and watch this a million times over. All of our talks are on the YouTube and on our page. And we do this every Sunday for free for you guys. We really just want you to enjoy being able to ask some questions of our anatomy team. Uh, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I love these Sundays with all of us together. It's just so much fun to be with you guys. Uh, Dr. Folkmer, any reason to talk to you is always a pleasure. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Folkmer, any last words? Just thank you guys so much. It is really, really fun to be able to do this. So thank you. And um, yeah, check out the collaborative membership because there definitely will be at least 100. <laughs> We're a little bit extra. <laughs> we are so extra. We had every intention if we to be once a week yeah. and twice a week because we're having so much fun. <laughs> it's going to be like, holy crap. Sammy Wong of Hong Kong said, you guys produce more material than I can watch. And we're like, okay, that's good. At least we're not falling short uh, of your expectations. Uh, Danny, any last words for them? Okay. Uh okay cool noise cool uh yeah no just uh just thank you everybody for taking taking time off from your sunday to come by and hang out with us and uh dork over anatomy so always always appreciated and uh hope to see you all again next week we are such dorks it's totally true uh speaking of one of my favorite dorks uh karen ravelis uh do you want to tell them a little bit like uh just goodbye and thanks or yeah no definitely uh agree with you on the dark on the darkness <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Thanks, you know, for everybody just for uh, for listening and um, anybody who uh, hasn't signed up for ID yet. <laughs> You're like our biggest advocate. I swear <laughs> to goodness, we do not pay her. You know what? I, I, I'm telling the truth. I, I, I really am. So, I mean, I'm not going to lie about it. I wouldn't be on these calls and why do it, right? Yeah, I know. You are a woman of 100% integrity. If you haven't gotten to know Karen yet, you should definitely, you know, PM her with any questions you have or, that are anatomy based. Uh, you know, she's one of our, we have such incredible teaching team members. We're so, I would say it's luck, but I think it's probably just prep and opportunity meeting and, and then just trying to give really good material. And, and I think that this teaching team is the best in the world. I really do. And I'm just so proud to be a part of these calls every Sunday. You guys really keep us going. You, you're sending us all these wonderful emails saying, you know, how much we do for you. But you do it for us. You got to know. Like, you are literally giving me CPR every Sunday sometimes. I may have a rough day or whatever. I get so excited about these calls. So thank you for listening and taking your time out. You could be doing anything else, and you're coming in to talk to us. So the, le the last thing that we could do, or least we could do, is share some knowledge bombs with you. So uh, we hope to see you next Sunday at 5 p.m. EST. Uh, check out the, the recording of this if you want to go back and hear everything again. And then bring your questions with you next week. We'd love to have you. And check out uh, the ID website if you want to learn some more stuff. Uh, Anna's made it super user-friendly. Click on anything, go to anything, and read about it. Uh, we'll see you next Sunday. And thanks so much for your time and attention. Bye.